I do think that the Democratic Party is going to have to be a little bolder in how we describe our economic options going forward. Look, we all want free and fair trade, and you can argue about negotiations with China or take a tougher stance with Mexico or what have you. But the fact is, and the data just shows this, the jobs that are going away are primarily going away because of automation. That's going to accelerate. Driverless Uber and the equivalent displacement that's going to be taking place in office buildings all around the country uh, is going to be scary for folks, which means that we are going to have to start thinking about where do jobs come from and how much government involvement is there in the marketplace. We, I think, probably have to be more creative about anticipating uh, what's coming down the pike because automation is relentless. Artificial intelligence has gone from science fiction to a, a, almost everyday reality now, and it's changing our lives in really profound ways. I think, personally speaking, it's one of the most exciting developments that I've encountered at Wired. And I'm curious just to turn it over to both of you and uh, to talk about this. Joey's the expert, so I'm going to defer to him. Uh, but my, my general observation, as you said, is that it is seeping into our lives in all sorts of ways that we just don't notice. Uh, and part of the reason is because uh, the way we think about AI uh, is colored by popular culture and by science fiction. And uh, I, I know it's a familiar distinction to a lot of your readers between uh, general AI and specialized AI. Specialized AI is really the stuff that we've been doing for quite some time, we're just getting better and better at it, and that is figuring out uh, using algorithms whether computers can figure out increasingly complex tasks. And we're seeing that happen uh, in every aspect of our lives, from medicine to transportation to uh, how electricity is distributed. And uh, it promises to create a vastly more productive and efficient economy. Uh, and if properly harnessed, can generate uh, you know, enormous uh, prosperity for people, opportunity for people, uh, can cure diseases that we haven't seen before, uh, can make us safer because it eliminates uh, inherent human error uh, in a lot of uh, work. But it also has some downsides that we're going to have to figure out in terms of, uh, if not um, eliminating jobs, requiring people to think differently about their occupations. Uh, it could increase inequality, uh, and we've seen that in technology generally and globalization. It can suppress wages. And so we're going to have to develop new social constructs in order to embrace fully and, and, and optimize uh, this, this new technology. While the outsourcing of jobs from north to south, from east to west, while a lot of that was a dominant trend in the late 20th century, the big, biggest challenge to workers in countries like mine today is technology. And the biggest challenge for your new president, when we think about how we're going to employ more people here, is going to be also technology, because artificial intelligence is here and it is accelerating. And you're going to have driverless cars, and you're going to have more and more automated services. And that's going to make the job of giving everybody work that is meaningful tougher. And we're going to have to be more imaginative. And the pace of change is, is going to require us to do more fundamental reimagining of our social and political arrangements to protect the economic security and the dignity that comes with a job. It's not just money that a job provides. It provides dignity and structure and a sense of place and a sense of purpose. And so we're going to have to consider new ways of thinking about these problems, like a universal income, review of our work week, how we retrain our young people, how we make everybody an entrepreneur at some level. But we're going to have to worry about economics if we want to get democracy back on track. Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard, Amy Klobuchar, all sitting at 5% in the state of New Hampshire. Kamala Harris at just 
3%. She's down six points in this poll. Not so top tier anymore, getting getting beaten by the candidate who she once brushed off as a fringe on the stage. I mean, Phil, I've talked about it here all the time. I think she just has no message. There's no reason to vote for her in this campaign. She has not been able to, to she basically has not been able to differentiate herself whatsoever in the field. And Kamala Harris is a very talented politician. She, when she wants to be. When she yeah. wants to be. Um, you know, she's able to deliver her lines, to be likable, to mm -hmm. be quick on her feet. But this is a policy problem. She's changed her, her plans on occasion, uh, gone going back and forth. I don't think that voters liked her brushing off other candidates. I didn't like, I, I don't think other uh, voters liked uh, seeing her sort of uh, see herself as inevitable. And, and we see it down six points already That's this huge. quickly. Yeah. Um, at this point, uh, if she continues along this path, uh, she'll be an also ran. What do you think, Max? Uh, Kamala Harris, in a yeah. lot of ways, is the most difficult case here because mm -hmm. she is so talented as a mm -hmm. candidate. She came out with with the branding of prosecuting the case against Donald Trump, which I thought was smart. She had that great opening in June against Joe Biden, but it's really one step forward and two steps back. Yeah. And if you can't clearly identify your constituency in this race, then you're really talking to nobody. And I yeah, think I people think right. just don't care about a slick politician anymore. It's yeah. not what they're looking for, you know? Like, we've been there, done that. They want someone who they know where they're going to stand and that they're authentic. I also <laughs> thought it was very interesting after the whole, like, Hillary Clinton, Tulsi Gabbard's a Russian asset <laughs> thing. This is apparently only in order to Tulsi's benefit, Phil. Yeah, she's yeah. got four points. <laughs> uh, well, I, I... This is a qualifying poll, too, yeah. by the way. Absolutely. Yeah, so she's got a qual one qualifying poll towards December um, and also one for the next debate, so I mean, this was incredibly helpful for her. Thanks, so, Hillary. So, <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard needs to say thank you publicly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that all of us are still sort of scratching our heads. Why did Hillary Clinton think that it was uh, necessary or even um, good for her to weigh in and attack uh, Tulsi Gabbard? Clearly, it didn't work. Um, but if you're if you're Tulsi's folks, um, you got to be like waving red meat in front of Hillary Clinton at this point. You want yeah, her so to attack again. Let's get her yeah. jumping at the debate again, right, Max? What do you think? I yeah. have this horrible feeling yeah. that Andrew. Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard, mm. uh, because they weren't dismissed early on, are going to end up like a Donald Trump situation, mm. and they'll be hanging around for months. Yeah. I, think. I, don't, I don't have a horrible feeling yeah. about that. I, like I that. have a good <laughs> feeling about yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I, look, what you can say about them, contrary to Kamala Harris and Pete and some of these other people that we've talked about, is you actually know what they think. I mean, they actually have principled positions that are different from the field. So yeah. I like the variety of having them out there making the case, and, well, I, and I like seeing them rise. Especially on the stage, right? Right. Like it's, it's for Tulsi Gabbard to be on this. It's always just good to have somebody who's good on foreign policy Absolutely. and willing to challenge the Absolutely. consensus of people on the stage uh, in the debates. And to your point, yeah. what do these two candidates deliver at the last debate? Right. Andrew Yang forces a substantive uh, right. debate about automation and UBI. And you know what? There were a lot of candidates who were up there uh, who weren't prepared to talk about automation that way. Right. Elizabeth Warren dismissed it out of hand. Yeah. And then what did Tulsi Gabbard do? Tulsi Gabbard, by her presence, led to the most substantive discussion on foreign policy. So maybe they're not going to get the nod. Maybe they're not going to get to the promised land. But I think that, you know, they will probably make the party have discussions that will make them stronger. Well, and Tulsi is the predominant reason that Kamala Harris now sits yeah. at 3%. <laughs> right. I mean, so. at the second, what was that, the second, second debate, debate, she just took her down totally. and she's never recovered. Yeah. Yeah. And to Andrew Yang's credit, I mean, he's raised $10 million last yeah. quarter in the face of a media blackout. So mm -hmm. it, he's a legitimate candidate in that sense. Maybe yeah, he's going to outraise Biden this quarter. <laughs> <laughs> right out of left field, Andrew Yang is drawing new support from an unlikely group, Trump supporters. I voted for Trump uh, in 16, and honestly, I'll probably vote for him again if Yang doesn't make it through. New Hampshire voter Anthony Hegstrom is one of several Trump supporters who have shown up to his New Hampshire rallies, now considering themselves part of the Yang gang many feeling disenchanted with the rest of the Democratic ticket. A lot of what's there right now is way too far left or it's too uh, typical mainstream. Biden's just the same old story. And uh, I voted for Trump to say, you know, for the idea of it's something different. The Yang campaign said this week he hauled in 10 million bucks in fundraising over the past three months, outpacing several of his Democratic rivals. His trademark promise to give every American a thousand bucks a month is helping build that momentum. I am peeling off tens of thousands of disaffected Donald Trump voters. The New Hampshire GOP pushed back on that claim in a statement to Fox News saying, quote, just like his math and his policies, that's a big joke. Many working Americans do not feel like Democrats are speaking to them. And just the fact that I'm focused on some of the economic issues that they are seeing in their communities, 
makes them at least receptive. Yang has been playing up his background as an outsider from the Washington political machine. He's never held public office before. Political science professor Dean Spiliota says it's a similar appeal President Donald Trump in 2016 had to many blue-collar voters. I do think it's instructive for other candidates to stop and think about what is it about his message that is appealing to this group of voters who might not typically vote Democratic? But Yang is still only polling at 2% in New Hampshire. Now the race is on to recruit anyone from any political persuasion into joining the Yang Gang. In Nashua, New Hampshire, Rob DiRienzo, Fox News. Hey, Michael Duran of the Hudson Institute is going to talk a little bit about the serial withdrawal. We have Tim Black, a YouTuber who came across both of our radars. He's going to be here in studio. We're very, very excited, very excited about, about, this. about that one. And then we have uh, some two conservative authors, some you might recognize, to talk about what conservatism is and how it might have changed. Not all what you're all excited about, but I'll make it an interesting conversation, <laughs> I promise. Uh, all that today and more on Ride. Crystal, Tom what's Wooden. on your radar? Clearly. <laughs> well, folks, we're still just under a week away from the next debate, but already debate number five is coming into focus. It will be hosted by MSNBC and The Washington Post on November 20th in Georgia. Here are some people who have not yet made that stage. Amy Klobuchar, Beto O'Rourke, Michael Bennett, Julian Castro, Steve Bullock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But today, we can report that Freedom Dividend champion Andrew Yang has, in fact, met the criteria and made that stage. Congrats to you and congrats to the Yang gang. Yang's relative success is one of the most fascinating dynamics of this race, I have to say. In a field crowded with senators, governors, and members of Congress, he's found more than just a foothold and, of course, has won the loyalty of a dedicated grassroots base who are completely committed to spreading his ideas and championing his campaign far and wide. So here's how I see it. Yang's campaign is really a triumph of substance over theater. He's overperformed, and others like Kamala and Booker and Kirsten Gillibrand and John Hickenlooper, all of whom were touted and praised by the media, have underperformed for really one simple reason. Yang actually stands for something. He decided to tell the truth about the massive transition our economy is undergoing and the incredible exploitation and corruption our system has enabled, even though it was not popular or what any political consultant would tell you to say. Here are three reasons just from this week alone that explain why Andrew is succeeding when so many others are not. So first of all, Washington has been completely gamed. For the first time in history, the 400 wealthiest Americans pay less in taxes than the bottom 50% do. To all the Reagan Republicans and corporate Democrats who made this historic day possible, congratulations, guys. I mean, really well done. To the rest of America, my guess is maybe you're ready for someone and something different. Second of all, automation is real. The New York Times ran an op-ed this week about how automation has disrupted the job application process and replaced traditional HR functions. Goldman Sachs has even embraced automated interviewing. Just goes to show that it's not just people working on a factory line whose jobs are threatened by AI. This is, of course, recognized by economists who've said that around half of our jobs could be eliminated through technology. White-collar workers, the robots are coming for you, too. But finally, Yang gets it. Just listen to him here on Alyssa Milano's podcast, Sorry Not Sorry. Right now, the myth is that we're a meritocracy. If you're smart and you work hard, regardless of your circumstances, you can make it. And then the numbers show that's generally incorrect. It's a lie in that if you look at the elite schools in the U.S., uh, you're like five, ten times more likely to go to one of those schools if you're from the top quintile than if you're in from the bottom quintile. And that right now we're essentially perpetuating opportunity and privilege and access among the same group of people. And then you have a sprinkling of exceptions to make it seem like there's something going on. But the numbers show that, that there's really not much going on, that we're much less uh, equal in terms of socioeconomic mobility uh, than other countries, other developed countries. We're the most unequal country by many measurements in the history of the world. This is exactly right. For decades now, Republicans and Democrats have shared the same mythology around the great American meritocracy. The only real difference was that Republicans thought the American meritocracy was already perfect, and Democrats believed it could be perfected if we just dealt with racism and sexism and other forms of bigotry. But the truth is, the meritocracy is a lie. 
Those born into wealth and privilege will always be able to game the system for their own benefit and their children's own benefit. But even more than that, the very notion that some people, because of their special lucky talents, deserve to have more money than they could ever spend in an entire lifetime, while some people deserve to starve because they don't happen to have those special lucky talents, is completely morally bankrupt, especially in a rich nation. There is absolutely no reason why everyone could not and should not have a life of dignity. For a long time, Americans have bought into the meritocracy, the American dream ideal. But when we watched banksters completely destroy our economy and get bailed out, while ordinary homeowners were intentionally left to have their homes seized and lives destroyed, it kind of made people think. Or when you see today a long economic expansion and good times rolling, but for only a select few people in a select few cities. Yang is one of a few politicians, and you know who they are, who have dared to tell the truth. And it turns out the American people are ready to hear it. Sagar, it strikes me that the Andrew Yang success story mm. is like the polar opposite of the Kamala story yeah. that you were telling me. Here Kamala comes in with all the resume items, right? right? The media attention, like everybody ready to mm -hmm. make her the next thing, yet she has nothing to offer in terms of a real vision or truth telling to the country. Meanwhile, Andrew Yang, who shouldn't have in this crowded field been able to get off the starting blocks, is going to be on the na next debate stage because he actually dared to have a vision and be honest about right. what was going on. His his rise is really just shows the failure of the Democratic elite in order to grapple with a lot of the problems that you just talked about in order to offer any real solutions. Like, he sh it shouldn't be possible for him to be doing what he's doing. Right. But he's just taking advantage of the massive gap and intellectual dearth that we've seen in the Democratic Party. And I think that that, that really, more than anything, explains his rise and, and just the sheer honesty of so much of his campaign. Again, which I do not agree with. <laughs> but you have to respect it. Yeah, I do it. respect it. Yeah. I mean, look, yeah. in a, a crowded field yeah. of how many, I mean, 20, some, yeah. however many candidates there were to start right. with, that he was able to break through and find this foothold mm. and really make something out of this campaign, introduce a concept into the American lexicon that really wasn't there before. It's amazing. It's an incredible achievement. Yep. Next up on Rising.